Hello and welcome to the first Games Degree video. I am David Conroy, lecturer at QUT, typically associated with some of the more technical aspects of developing games, primarily within Unity. As the first video in this series, I would just like to take a moment to discuss what these videos are generally about. QUT's Games Degree is quite a busy process, and sometimes we don't have the class time to address certain game mechanics or aspects of game development and implementation that we would always like to. These videos are designed to address these niche or sometimes global games degree topics for the benefit of all students and staff no matter what point they are within the degree. Today we will be discussing the implementation of a handful of advanced weapon mechanics that students sometimes ask me about. These questions are usually inspired by technical demonstrations that I have shown students, including a game I developed that recently got greenlit called Retaliator. Now this shmup had several advanced weapon mechanics, including, for example, laser beams, guided missiles, and AoE explosion damage. So today we will talk about these very common but potentially tricky weapon mechanics to help you develop your game development skills. So before we get started, I would just like to say that the download link is available alongside this video in the description. And this link will consist of basically the project you're seeing in front of you right now, which is a project made in Unity 5.5.1, which as you can see is a very abstract scene containing a single player and a group of enemies. So if you're just interested in the scripts or just wanted to play around with this project yourself a little bit to get a handle on it, feel free to download it from the link below and try it out. So the first mechanic we are going to explore today will be that of a laser beam. Now typically in video games this consists of using a combination of a raycast effect and at least in the case of Unity what's called a line renderer. So just to demonstrate this gameplay mechanic, if I just press play now and press mouse button 0 in this case, which will be the left mouse button, a laser beam gets fired out, which will eventually do damage to and destroy the enemies in the scene. So this is going to be the mechanic that we are going to investigate first. So to do that, the first thing we need to do is actually investigate a little bit about our players set up within the scene hierarchy. So if you open this project and extend the player, you'll notice that the player has a couple of empties attached to it. The first one being an empty located pretty close to the player, actually directly within it, that is simply just an empty that has a line renderer component on it. Now this is going to give us that visual effect of a laser beam I've actually set up a material here for you, for you to use. Feel free to take that if it suits your purposes. But more importantly, this laser beam needs to have a, a target. Or maybe more of a crosshair would be the more accurate description of this. And this is in the form of another empty attached specifically to the laser beam that's a little bit away from it. In this case, 50 along the Z axis. Now all this does is make our laser have a target so that if this laser was to be rotated slightly then the laser target would also be rotated with respect to the laser beam. Additionally, make sure that you have a good look at some of the aspects of the line renderer component, specifically using world space here. Now depending on how you set up your potential laser beams, Ticking this can give you, let's say, different results, particularly if you have your laser beams parented to other objects. Generally speaking, using world space will fix most problems, uh, making the laser beams calculate their positioning based on a point of origin, that being the player. 
Additionally, you can totally modify a lot of the other variables alongside this, including modifying the laser beam's width. I've left it at one here because our game isn't that large, but if you say, for example, needed much larger lasers, you can make that bigger. If you needed lasers that needed to change shape, you could modify that variable in script as well. So none of these things are static, particularly the positioning of the line renderer. And this is the main component that we're going to be adjusting in script. So let's walk through the basic script for activating this laser beam. Now, you can change the script component of this quite easily to make it automatic, just in case you wanted to say have a trip wire effect. Uh, but if you're like me, you like laser beams shooting from the player when you press a button, there's a couple of things you need to account for when setting this up. So within the scripts directory, open up the player script in your editor of choice. Scroll up to the top of the script. You'll notice that we have set up a few variables here for you, which should be sufficient in getting this laser to do its thing. Importantly, the two variables that I've made public at the beginning is that laser beam and that laser target. Now you may notice that I've called this a line renderer instead of a game object. And that's because Unity is actually smart enough to pick up the line renderer component on a game object if you were to say drag it in. In this case, I've actually dragged the laser beam game object, but it's picking up the line renderer, which is what we actually want to use within the script. Laser target is the exact same deal, dragging the game object in there. Uh, that's because we need that positioning, that direction that we need to aim this laser towards. So back within the script, that's why we have those two public, just to allow for communication to the line renderer and the target that we want to be shooting it towards. And we'll talk about that in a sec. After this, we have some variables that you are free to change. The first two are just for the purposes of setting up a damage timer so that we're dealing damage slowly to targets over time. So we don't blow them up instantly in one frame. A controlled rate, so you could almost call it a rate of fire. And finally, the actual damage that we do with this laser at that rate of fire. So these constitute the actual damage per second that you would do with this laser beam. So before we talk about how this laser beam works, let's just briefly talk about the controls of our player. Now again, this is an abstract game scenario, this isn't a complete game. so. The player that we control only moves, or sorry, rotates left and right, as well as having a couple of weapon controls. So just to demonstrate this, if we go back into our game and I press the controls A and D, you'll notice our player is very slowly, oops, moving left and right. So that's what controls do. Moving on, the laser beam is a little bit interesting. It is first of all a method called from update, which calls a private void laser beam, so no parameters or return type. And the first line of code is asking for a mouse button input. Now this will continuously activate as long as you hold the mouse button down. So as long as you're holding this down, a laser beam will come out. In fact, that is the first line of code that we have within this conditional. Turn the line renderer on. So if you remember correctly, our laser beam is a line renderer and we are simply enabling it so that it becomes visible. So while we're holding down the trigger, show the beam with our next two lines of code indicating where we want to draw that beam. So the first position, as in position zero within the index of our beam array positioning, in this case we only have two, zero and one. But the first point of this is actually going to be at the laser beams dot transform dot position. So wherever you have placed that laser beam, in this case within the center of our player, that's where it'll be drawn from. And the final position will be drawn at that laser target. So that empty that we had out in the middle of nowhere 
is where our laser beam is drawing, or at least attempting to draw, that laser beam to. So if I actually just press play and hold this down, you'll see our laser beam eventually does get to that target. So the rest of this is pretty straightforward. We have our out, out variable, and one of the questions we can ask about our out variable, that called hit, is to typically talk to whatever transform that it has touched and ask it about its tag. In this case, we want to know if whatever it's run into has the tag enemy, right? Because we want to do damage to this enemy if we're shooting an enemy. And if we have, if we have actually collided with an enemy, then let's redraw the final position of our laser beam to be at this point. So you, if you remember, we drew the initial point to be at our laser target, which was kind of like our crosshair. Here, we're simply drawing it at the thing that we're hitting. So, that makes the effect of the laser hitting enemy targets. If we go back into our game, and we press play and do this, you'll see that our raycast is colliding with various enemies and redrawing the line renderer component, just like our if statement says. So the next aspect of that is simply where you want to do damage. Now you can opt to simply just blow up enemies by destroying them, but I've implemented a slightly more complex system here where we're actually going to do some damage to the target in a time-based method. So you could almost call this a damage over time component. And all of that consists of is a timer. And anyone who knows me knows that I just like to use very simple variables to control my time. In this case being that I'm asking the question if this variable, or sorry, if the time is greater than a variable called laser damage time, then we tell the object in question, in this case the enemy, to take damage. That being that laser damage, which I think we set to what, 15? And then we increase the laser damage time so that we have this process of every, what, 0.2 seconds, this if statement activates and we send damage to the enemy. So just to articulate that, the enemy actually has a method on it called take damage. It's a public method, so it accepts it and it has that parameter damage. So essentially we're telling that object to call this method and then with that parameter do something about it. In this case we're mitigating health. So that's how we're dealing damage to the enemies. So the final component of this is what to do when we're not pressing mouse button left or zero in this case. And really the thing that you want to do is just turn the laser beam off because everything else is going to not be prevalent uh, if you're not shooting the laser beam. In this case, we could combine the initial if statement, this one here, to have a alternative else statement that simply turns the laser beam line renderer off. And if that's happening, then nothing else is going to happen either. So one of the other elements of our very simple game here is that we have the capacity to fire guided missiles. Now these guided missiles are simply self-guided projectiles that track down the closest enemy and explode on contact. So you could almost call them a fire and forget delivery system. Now this was something that I had kind of experimented with quite a fair bit within my game. But implementing it can be a little tricky. You need to use a couple of different techniques combined. So first of all, let's talk about the missile prefab. So the player simply at will, if you look in the actual script, which we'll get to in a sec, fires a guided missile that is a game object that specifically has a collider with a trigger component attached. 
and also has a rigid body, so it has the capacity to interact th with things directly and ask questions about it. This missile, specifically just for visual purposes, has what we call a trail renderer attached to it as well. And that just gives it that kind of rocket trail, uh, which you can also customize to varying degrees. So, within our player, we're firing that guided missile game object. And we do have some timers and variables set up to control the fire rate of that too. But after that point, that missile then contains the information necessary to do damage. That's not specifically controlled by the player. And this is a part where a lot of students can get confused as well. How do I make that missile do that damage? So the answer to that question lies completely on the guided missile itself. The guided missile, the prefab version, has a guided missile script. And just to demonstrate what these guided missiles actually do, is if I press this a number of times, you'll see these objects flying out, tracking down the enemies and eventually blowing up. So the guided missile itself has a guided missile script, which does the vast majority of the work. The guided missile has a couple of variables relating to its movement speed and rotation speed. Uh, as well as a lifetime variable, just telling it how quickly or how long it should wait before it actually automatically destroys itself. So you, you really do want to do this with most of the projectiles that you instantiate into the world. You want to tell them to despawn, simply to recycle them so you don't have objects moving out into the void forever. So how does this actually work? First of all, our guided missiles spawn and communicate initially to what's called an array of enemies. And all this is doing is finding the game objects in the world that are tagged as enemy and fills them up, fills this array up every game loop. So great, we know the enemies that exist in the scene. However, we want to declare a target because we can't really have a self-guided missile unless we have something to move towards. So we set up a private game object target and we state that if we don't currently have a target, say for instance when we spawn or if our target gets destroyed, find another one. In this case, we tell target to call a method, find closest enemy unit, and this method does a couple of interesting things. In essence, it will basically ask which enemy is the closest enemy amongst the groups of enemies that are currently available. Now that group of enemies comes in the form of the enemies contained in our enemies array. So if we go back up to the top, this array that we're talking about here that we fill in update, we are then moving through within the guts of a for each loop. So for each of the enemy in these enemies, let's do some basic vector math regarding their positioning and eventually tell me which one of those enemies, if there are enemies in the scene, is the closest. And that gives us our target. Now you will typically find you may need to do something like this method quite frequently in the games that you make. Many times you'll want to ask the question, go to the closest enemy. That could be another player or something to do with artificial intelligence. This kind of a method will generally do the trick for you. Find me the closest enemy amongst a group of them. After that, the missile simply moves. And as you would expect, that mostly just consists of, first of all, moving forward. So there's a couple ways you can do this. But, in my opinion, the easiest way is just to move that missile along its forward vector at a speed that you've set accounting for delta time. You never want to forget about delta time, otherwise your games go crazy. So, let's not have crazy games. Interestingly though, we want to make our missile slowly rotate towards the target in question. So some of you are probably quite familiar with the 
uh, alternative call transform.lookat, if I can actually spell today. And what lookat typically does is, in one frame, make your object in question face another object. For the purpose of a guided missile, that's not a very realistic look. We want this guided missile to slowly rotate, and we do this with what's called linear interpolation. Now, you can write your own lerp function, but you'll find it's a lot easier just to set up something like this, which makes use of a quaternion by the name of target rotation, which does a little bit of quaternion math to figure out the degree of rotation we want our missile to move on. And this gets updated every frame, so the rotation value adjusts depending on the difference that the angle of the two objects are from each other. Cool, so we fire a missile, it flies towards the enemy that's closest, but then what? Then what happens? Then what happens is we have our on trigger enter statement. So hopefully you guys are somewhat familiar with these already. If not, just know that there are trigger events set up in Unity that you can communicate to. On trigger, enter, exit, stay are all examples of that. In this case, I'll be using an on trigger enter statement. Now this has a parameter that is a collider. I've called it other object in this case, which means that any other object that we hit, we can ask questions about. In this case, I ask the question again, is our object an enemy? And if it is, blow up, destroy this missile. Now, this is where we do something particularly interesting. Besides this explosion effect, which is just a particle effect that you were seeing before, what we actually do next here is something you may not be familiar with. Now the idea here is that we want the ability to spawn an explosion or an AOE damage sphere that does damage based on the values we feed it. So this object that spawns, which is just a collider, has the capacity to be generic enough so that we can change values. Now what you may be unfamiliar with is that you can actually do this on the fly. You can tell objects that you've just instantiated into the game world to change properties about them. So that, for instance, you can make this explosion bigger or smaller, or change how much damage it does. So this could be applied to something like a nuclear explosion, i.e. make it really big and do an absolutely massive amount of damage. In this case, this is just a guided missile. So we set this up to simply spawn an instance of a game object. We've called it this AOE in this case. And it instantiates an AOE effect as a game object, which means we have the capacity to then talk about this AOE. Because we've spawned it as a game object within our instance of this script, we can then talk to this object's components, in this case, the AOE damage components called AOE damage. Here we simply just adjust its size and damage. So some of you might be asking, what the heck is this AOE damage business? What is AOE damage? Well, when you do certain things in games like fire a rocket, you might sometimes notice that the further you are away from the explosion, the less damage you take. That is in essence what we're going to be trying to capture here. So if you go back into the game, you'll notice that there is a prefab setup called, conveniently, AOE Damage. And lo and behold, it has a script on it called AOE Damage. And if you look at our guided missile, you'll notice that one of the game objects that it's set to instantiate is AOE damage. So we are actually spawning an AOE damage effect into the world to area of effect damage the enemies contained within it. So let's look at the script behind this. 
The first thing you'll notice is that we've set up two public floats for you, simply being the damage and size variables that we adjusted within Guided Missile. So those carry over when our missile explodes. We also have a list of enemies that we're going to do something slightly different with. And we also have a lifetime. So now we need to ask the question, what is actually happening within this area of effect? We typically don't want it or need it to last very long. An explosion is a very quick burst of energy that should do damage to objects within it based on their proximity to the center of the explosion. So what we actually have to set up is exactly that. We set up an on-trigger enter event, but instead of specifically spawning or damaging enemies, we want to add them to a list. So we have an explosion on-trigger enter event that will put enemies that it's touching into a list. Then, within update, our explosion will last a very small amount of time. Sorry, our AoE damage effect. In this case, it's only 0.1 of a second. So 0.1 of a second after that explosion goes off, we'll make a check. In this case, we're asking the question for each of the enemies in enemies, if that enemy still exists, because it could be possible that multiple explosions are going off or whatever's happening and killing them before you get to talk about them. We do a damage calculation based off the distance that the enemy is from the center of the explosion. And in this case, we use the size of the explosion uh, for purposes of, I guess, not inversing the mathematics there so that you accidentally heal things. Try not to walk into that territory. Using a size variable and taking into consideration the size of your explosion and the distance that enemies within it are away from the center, we can then calculate an appropriate coefficient to multiply by the damage. And then you just tell the enemy to take that damage component. So what do we end up with here? Well, basically, you know we can shoot lasers, which is cool. We can shoot missiles. They'll self-guide and they will hit objects. And based on their proximity away from that explosion, let's, for example, just click on this enemy, you'll see that, wow, that enemy is nearly dead. It took an amount of damage relative to its positioning from the center of that explosion. In fact, if we just select the one next to it, you'll see that this one has slightly more health. So it was a little bit further away from that explosion, therefore it took less damage. So in cases like this, you'll need to muck around a little bit with the size of the explosion, specifically how you're scaling it relative uh, to how much damage you actually want to be doing within that explosion effect. So you'll need to find a nice balance there. But the resulting effect is a semi-lethal player that has the capacity to do lots of damage to multiple enemies in various ways. And as you can imagine, just combining these effects together will make a very interesting gameplay experience, uh, quite similar to the one that I developed in the game that I made, Retaliator, uh, which I'll, I'll put a link down there if you do want to check that out yourself. You can actually play a demo if you're interested in giving it a go. So, thank you for watching the first video in the Games Degree video series. There'll be plenty more discussing other various niche mechanics like this, as well as certain other topics that will be of benefit to you during the Games Degree at QUT. Thank you.